And I get mad when people are like, you servers, you're so selfish, blah, blah, blah. It's the same shit in the corporate world, dude. The guy that's been there longer than you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can't say shit. Yeah. If you do, you lose your job. Yeah. And it's just an office building. Seniority. Seniority. Yeah. It's in everything you do in life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And everything. Yeah. And if you don't want to deal with it, you're going to get kicked to the back of the line every fucking time. Unless you're either uber talented, super connected, or crazy as fuck. That was Joel Tudor. I'm Jamie Brissick. You're listening to Soundings, brought to you by The Surfer's Journal. The Surfer's Journal is a member-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. More of a book than a magazine, TSJ brings you 120 pages of independent storytelling every eight weeks, covering the people, culture, travel, and art of surfing. To learn more or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. So today my guest is Joel Tudor. Joel turned pro at age 14. He won his first ASP contest at age 15, making him the youngest competitor to win an ASP event. Joel came out of San Diego. I was just starting to write about surfing at the time that he came up on the scene, and I remember doing a piece about him for Warp Magazine. It would have been 1993 or 94. He was unique in that through longboarding, he was mining surf culture and surf history in a way that most shortboarders were not. He acknowledged the past. He acknowledged where we'd been. We became friends. I watched him tear it up. And with this grace that included cross-stepping, but also these great backhand hooks and sweeping cutbacks, there was a flow with the wave that was different to what we shortboarders were doing. From 1999 to 2004, Joel collaborated with photographer Michael Halsband to create Surfbook, which was in many ways tying together all of Tudor's influences. He was featured in many films, among them Thomas Campbell's The Seedling, Sprout, and The Present, Surf Movie Reels 1 through 14 by Michael Halsban, One California Day by Jason Baffa and Mark Jeremias, and on and on and on. He really surprised me when he jumped into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and became a world champion. And speaking of world champions, he won surfing world titles in 1998 and 2004, and then in 2021 in his 40s. So here we go, Joel Tudor. At the time, this is, might have been the question I asked you back then, and it would be the one I would start with here, is um, what made you become a longboarder as opposed to a shortboarder like so many kids were doing at that time? Uh, well, I started on, on shortboards, right? I mean, the first board that I remember getting a wave on was a small board. I actually still have it. Um, but then I went on a trip with my dad uh, to Puerto Vallarta when I was like seven, I think, or eight, and I borrowed his longboard. Uh, I went out and surfed this one little wave kind of by myself one day. And I don't know, there just there was some weird feeling about the that much area and board and like how out of the water I was compared to riding a smaller board. That when I came home, that that was the trip where he kind of like got me into surfing. He bought me another small board. But then at about 10, I started borrowing my uncle's longboard and he had like an 8, 10 or whatever it was. And it just felt, I don't know, it felt felt cool Mm -hmm. and that that was what kind of and my dad rode a longboard so did my uncle so it was sort of something i was like used to being around yep i mean not that it ever really went away there were always people that kind of rode them through all the generations but my dad was one of those guys that when it first started to come back in like the late 70s and early 80s he would was purchasing boards from you know bill shrosby uh here in in encinitas so it wasn't abnormal for me to see that kind of surfing and both my dad and uh, my uncle tony were both really good surfers so i had it Two good examples of, of how to ride them correctly, you know. And where were you surfing mostly back then? Cardiff. Okay. Cardiff. You know what what's interesting that I've observed, and certainly during this time, is being a longboarder, it was sort of a um, a way into the history and the culture of the sport in a way that maybe shortboarding wasn't. Uh, I, that stuff all came later. I mean, the, 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 the years that I'm talking about when I first got them was probably like 1985, mm-hmm. right? In 86, I got my first custom shortboard, but I was still borrowing my uncle's uh, longboards and stuff. And then around 1987, I think I kind of realized that I was like getting good at it. I was like, wow, I'm starting to kind of understand how this stuff's happening. Uh, Steve Walden started kind of like giving me some boards. You know, he had kind of a big team at that time and they were all competing. He gave me a handful of boards. And then in the summer of 88, because my dad had, had, you know, like I said, he was a good surfer. He had ridden a ton of different Takayamas and all these events were popping up. 
my dad was just sort of like, hey, you know, maybe you should go down to the one in Del Mar and try and talk to Takayama and see if you can, like, get his attention, you know. Uh, maybe he could get you some boards. I mean, they're expensive. My dad couldn't afford to buy me Takayamas, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I did. That summer I went down to the event here in 15th Street and, and tr tracked him down and kind of like he had noticed me off to the side, you know. I mean, I thought I was good enough. I was good enough. He kind of noticed, you know, and 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 then he just sort of invited me to come up and get boards. Mm -hmm. And that fell into how I got all the, like, historical stuff. I mean, prior to meeting him, all I knew about was the Endless Summer. And whatever, like, surfers were in that film, that was the extent of my education. And whatever Surfer Magazine gave you to it, which at that time in the 80s, there was still a lot of info still available in those mags. Mm -hmm. It hadn't really just become like a catalog for sport yet. Yep. Uh, Pezman and those guys really did a good job. If you look at that era of, of media, there was always recap issues that told like historical stuff and gave you an idea of how we got here. And it was before it became a catalog for, for the companies that were advertising. Yep. Back then, it was actually still a message. And the people that were in charge of it were, were really educated and, and came from the very foundational beginning, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> like Severson's kids, yep. you know? Yeah. So it's... So you're like in your mid-teens, who were your heroes at that time? Like who were the guys you were looking up to? Um, I, well, any kid in their teens in the 1980s, Tom Curran was, you know, he, a hero no matter what. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that one. Um, but I, I, you know, I grew up around here and, and Colin Smith and, and Trevor Christ and John Sabrell and, you know, Machado was like the wonder kid, you know, amazing. And then, you know, I grew up down in, in like UC Claremont area. You know, and we'd see pictures of Joe Roper and, and Skip was always like God, you know, mm -hmm. and San Diego Fry's always been like a, had his own little mystical yeah. uh, presence pretty yeah. much for the whole South County. Yeah, those were the influences at that time. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what is it about Skip? And I asked that. I've, I, I, I get it, but I think the listeners may not know. What is, why is Skip so influential? My dad told a pretty funny story uh, the other day. He went and ordered a Fry in 1960 nine or 68 mm -hmm. and he went to the factory and he said that larry walked him outside and was like i want you to know that it might take a while skip likes to surf a lot you know uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was like so even then he was known it would take a while to get a board you yeah. know what i mean yeah. and but my dad said he had a following because he was just always so smooth yeah you know? yeah and and he was the the original san diego you know him and henson mm -hmm. were the two dudes yeah i remember seeing him at La Jolla Shores, and he would ride every wave to the sand and step off. To the beach. Yep. That was kind of his thing, right? Yeah, all the way till it stopped. Yeah. Yeah, and through him and Donald, were really close, so I got to like, you know, from the age of 12, I had a lot of access to be around him. Yep. Donald Takayama would have been a big mentor in your, in your career. I don't, I mean, I think when my dad went there, like, you know, telling me to go and get boards from, I don't think he had any idea to the extent of the reach that Donald had. Yeah. And like all the stuff that was going to become available to me. Yep. I think that kind of threw him off a little bit too, because it's like, it went from like, just like meeting him to then like meeting that young. And then, in, do you know what I mean? And then both of them together were like, you know, finding sponsors for me and, and, you know, getting me to go on trips and take me to contests in different countries. And like, and like Nueva started coaching me and you have to imagine for a dad, that was sort of a, like, he even said, he goes, it was kind of overwhelming. Do you know what I mean? He was yeah. like, these are guys that I looked up to and like read magazines and all the shit. And he goes, and then all of a sudden they just stepped in and kind of took my 12 year old and like, you know, he was like, I had to put a lot of trust in some like, you know, pretty interesting uh, characters. Yeah. What, but what? it was, it was great because they were all super, uh, it was, it was tough love, but it was, it was honest and the education on like surfboards and what worked and what waves and blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like priceless. Yeah. I couldn't have asked for a better. And then Herbie stepped in around that time too. Herbie, uh -huh. Herbie, like around 12 or 13 started like. Herbie Fletcher. Yeah. Herbie Fletcher started helping too. Yeah. Uh, kind of with everything. Yep. Um, um, you turn pro at age 14. 14. And you yeah. won your first pro contest, right? Well, because I just, no, I'd, I'd been starting to take money. Uh, when I was 12, I started making finals with, you know, some of the, the events that were paying out. And at that time, you used to give your money to the USSF. I don't know if anyone remembers this. Uh -huh, I remember those days, yeah. Yeah, United States Surfing Federation, yep. and they would, like, hold on to your money for travel or different things so you could still maintain an amateur status. And I had donated thousands of dollars to that thing, and I never saw it. I never mm -hmm. got it back. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just this one check where, like, at the time, I think it was, like, 3400 bucks or something like that. And my, I said to my dad, I'm like, what do I what? So keep it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like... There's no point in you competing as a junior anymore. You know mm -hmm, what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like you're like beating the men, so you just do the men's division. So for a long time, 
I was in the men's division while guys like Tyler Hazekian and Colin McPhillips were still doing the juniors, but hmm. they're older than me. Uh huh. Uh huh. Which is pretty funny. Yeah. I always kind of laughed at that. Like I think I was winning pro divisions when those guys were still doing men's and junior men's and stuff. Wow. And they're like three or four years older than me. Were there many kids your age riding longboards at that time? Yes, there were a handful. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I knew all of them. We yeah. all knew each other. It was. It was. There were less than 30 of us in the entire coast of California. Do you yep. know what I mean? Yeah, you kind of, I, I think you and maybe those guys sort of ushered in this new generation of younger kids. There were kids. guys before us, though, like, but that group was even smaller. That group was of like 15 people. Do you uh -huh, know what I mean? Uh -huh. Like, that was like Brian Bent and, and, and Jeff Kramer and, you know what I mean? They were all a generation before me that were like 16, 17, 18, yeah. 19, and we're all riding longboards and doing all this stuff. And then I popped up, I'm like, summer of 87 or 88 or whatever yep and what was it like going to um you were sponsored by oxbow as i remember yeah that was all through nat yep so you, you have so you're with nat young you're going to these um these like wor world events and then festivals as well which was an interesting thing because shortboarding didn't so much have festivals but there was like the noosa festival there was a Biritz festival where you have people of, some of them are in their 70s and 80s you've got yeah, they brought everybody yeah what was that what did it feel like going on that kind of uh, odyssey i didn't realize until i got older how cool it was you yeah. know what i mean yeah. when i started to look at the pictures and shit and i was like oh my god i didn't realize i was like what that guy because i don't even know who some of them were at the time mm -hmm. i was like 15 and 16 your 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 historical reference is pretty limited i was still in the path of learning all that stuff it's not like i knew all that crap at that age yeah uh, it happened a lot later because I had like learned all this stuff and then I'd look at pictures. And I'm like, whoa, dude, that's the guy that took me to dinner. That's the dude that put, you know what I mean? That's the one that I didn't realize I was with this one or that, you know, it mm -hmm, just, it mm -hmm. kind of like, it just sort of all happened. Yep. Were the contests that you went to in the, and the festivals, were they more kind of like the experience or was it about who won at the end of the day? Oh, it was way more about the party. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. It was way more about the the, the all those guys being able to be together and see each other because a lot of them haven't been around each other in twenty five years or whatever. Exactly. So it was it was more of a party, uh, and I mean, really, they were like just a little bit older than I am now. That's mm -hmm. the part that I trip out on. They mm -hmm. weren't that much older than me than yeah. where I'm at at this point. You yeah, know? yeah. When you won your first world title in nineteen ninety eight, did it was it did it feel like a big deal or was it something that was just part of? Well, I'd come close so many times prior. Yeah, yeah. And I'd had like a couple ones where that like, you know, I mean, I still to this day don't think I lost and I've seen the footage and, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. I, I think at that age, they weren't going to let me win because I was just too young. Mm -hmm. I was like 15, dude. Yeah. I think they kind of halted my, my winning just to make sure that I didn't just burn out right away. Yeah. That was sort of the way I took from it. Cause I've seen the footage. I know when I lose, mm -hmm. I still to this day don't think i lost mm -hmm. i mean the first one the first in 1990 1990 i think it was 1990 or 91 i would have won this is pretty funny i ended up finishing third i was 15 that year okay i didn't know how points worked and neither did my parents and in france there was like a week gap or 10 days between biritz and hasagor and i'd already been gone for two weeks mm -hmm. and my mom was just like dude there's no way my 15 year old son is staying over there for a month mm -hmm. and donald was leaving and i didn't really have any like parental no one to watch me. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. I could have gone. Uh, I'm sure Nat could have set me up with somebody, but I really didn't have anyone to keep an eye on me. Right. So I came home. I skipped Tossigor, and then I went to Rio, and I got third. Okay. And I had a first, first and two thirds. Okay. And all I needed to do was make it through like a couple heats, and I would have made it through a couple heats. Right. 100%. Yeah. So I remember Al Hunt, when I got to the, the Alternativa one in Brazil, he was like, Joel, you realize you would have won? Like, he's like, today, when you just made it through that round, he goes, I would be giving you a world title if you had just shown up Damn. in Hasagor. Wow. You know what I mean? And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, you skipped an event. Uh -huh. You're like in the running to win, uh -huh. you know? I'm surprised with all the great mentors in your life, no one clued you into this. Dude, there were no cell phones then. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you couldn't send an email. You had to send a fax. Right. Or you had to, and all my mentors were Donald and those guys. You yeah. Know? And you remember, he just gotten out of prison like seven years prior yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. For yep. cocaine trafficking. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> you yep. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> they didn't, like, I didn't. I uh, just that there wasn't the the network of people that would have been like, hey, did you you know did you check the website to see what the points were? Did you you know what I mean? Yep. That kind of shit could slip. Yeah. And and then that was really the last year it was a tour. The uh -huh. next year it, it went back to one event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then from then on, I I kept, I kept a, like I kept coming close, but I wasn't like I just didn't get it. And then ninety eight, I finally got it. Yep. And around this time, you would have been doing a lot of time out at Pipeline, long stints. I was already, I was, yeah, my time was already in. Once in, I went in the winter of 1990, 
I ended up winning a surfboard in 1989. At the summer of 89, I won a board in the raffle. Okay. I won a Scott Anderson Aquatech longboard. Uh -huh. That I paid $10 for the raffle ticket. And I won it. And then I took it home and I went to the longboard grotto and Sam Ryan gave me 350 bucks for it. And I bought a ticket on uh, TWA. I think it was Transworld Airlines mm -hmm. with my brother. And we flew to Hawaii. Wow. And, uh, and Tom Eberly of Lightning Bolt fame yep. um, called Joe Galanka, who was the lifeguard, because we were flying over with Brad Anderson, who was uh, one of the, I mean, he was a filmer back then, which was rare. You know what I mean? There weren't a ton of them. And he was calling Smith's filmer. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, Eberly got us this place to stay. And we stayed there for two weeks. And then I stayed with Butch Van Artstalen's wife for a couple of days. Hmm. Crazy, like, connection of all the, like, yeah. his wife Annie put us up for a couple nights. Uh, and then I just, I knew right then that I would always want to go back. Mm. So from that winter forward, I saved my money until I could, like, you know, make sure I could be there. And was it the North Shore lifestyle? Was it pipeline specifically? It was as a everything spot? that I had ever seen in every surf movie. Because, uh, you know, in all the old surf movies, there was always a Hawaii scene, a South yeah. Shore in the summer. Yep. You know what I mean? It was all these things. And then I got there and I was like, wow, it's no joke. It's the real thing. Mm hmm. You know, and I, and I was already getting schooled by Roper down here at Big Rock. You know, and I'd been surfing Totos already for a couple of years. My dad started taking me down there when I was 12. Mm -hmm. So I had this, like, exposure to big waves, kind of. And then once I got there and I saw it, I was like, wow, this place is fucking everything, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, and making your way up the, the pecking order at Pipeline, what was that like? It took a while. Yeah. Yeah, it took a long time. Years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Years. Uh, but it was so cool because I think about it now and I just laugh at all the like the memories and stuff and mm -hmm. all the like. I remember one year I paddled out and I asked, uh, you know, I asked Strider. I'm like, dude, where do I sit? Because <laughs> <laughs> Strider was kind of the man back then. Yeah, you know, sure. I mean, for California, yep. it's like 1990, 91, you yep. know, yeah, or 92 or something. And I asked him like where to sit. And I remember he was just like, fucking in there, Gromit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because like, he had had to pay his dues to get there. Yeah. But he showed me around a lot in the beginning, kind of mm -hmm. showed me where to sit. Like, yep. Tough love kind of deal. Yep. And then in 1993, I was walking uh, out of my heat in France, and I seen Jerry coming down the beach. And he, like, walked right to me. You know what I mean? It was pretty rad. We both, like, because I could tell you, oh, oh, he's walking towards me. And then I walked towards him. He's like, you're Donald's little guy, huh? You know, and I'm like, yeah, I, I know who you are. And he's like, no, nah, nice to meet you. He's like, hey, if you... Uh, if you guys come to Hawaii this year, you know, reach out to my wife. You're welcome to stay if you want. So that was kind of the beginning of like the Japanese guys, because Tak and them got wind of that. Oh, to go to Masuda, yeah. And yep. Tak was just like, oh my God, I'll rent the house for like, you know what I mean? If you get, if we have permission to rent it, yep. I'll rent it for two months or whatever. So yeah. he rented it for two months and then we stayed. And then it was kind of like the door was open. I could, you know, Tony would let me stay mm -hmm. whenever I needed to be there. And there were times where the house was empty, dude. You're the I mean, only would, one staying in Jerry Lopez's house. and there would be no house. one in there but me. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And you're looking straight out to pipe. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They charged me 250 bucks a week. Wow. Those were the days. Yeah. I used to pay 250 a week to stay. And did staying there and putting in that time <laughs> at so pipe. so crazy. It was a lot of money then, 250 a week for me. I yeah. didn't have a ton of cash, you know? Yep. But I think about it now, it's like hilarious. Doing that time though, looking out, standing on the balcony, looking into the barrel of pipe, did that... Um, did all that time sort of help you to get the relationship with the spot? Yeah, because you had at that time the yard was everything. That was the there were no team houses. Yeah, you had like Benji's house was over here. Yeah, and then you had Jerry's house was here, and then you had the Johnsons were right here. Everything else was whoever luck, lucked into a place to stay. Davy Miller was down over there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Davy and I were really close. He was really cool to me when I was young out there. Like nice. really, really. I got. To, I didn't learn a lot from him. I learned what not to do from him. Uh -huh. But I, he was really like friendly. And Jay Adams too, from a super young age, he kind of like kept an eye on me over there. Yeah. My first winter, I almost got beat up at V-Land. Uh -huh. And I was just about to get beat up and he intervened. Do you know what I mean? Because I had a Santa Monica Airlines sticker on my surfboard. Huh. And he knew, you know what I mean? Because those stickers were rare. Yeah. <clears throat> he knew right away that I was skippers, you know what I mean? Right, skipping. Well, so yeah. he like, back off. And they all kind of backed off of me. J-Boy. Yeah, because VLAN was different for all you kids that serve VLAN now with your filmers and your helmets and all your parents and shit. And your mom on the beach. Good luck, dude. Back then, you couldn't do that. That yeah. was like a no-no. Yeah, I went was... out there for my first time, and I got totally surrounded. 
and was about to die. Huh. And 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 because all the neighborhood kids had never seen a little blonde dude on a longboard, you know. And Jay intervened and backed them all off. It was pretty cool. Wow. But yeah, they were all uh, that little crew and and uh, and Briley. You know, I met Briley. We were all really young. Uh -huh. I was like I was like sixteen or something when I met Sean. Yeah. So I was in with all the neighborhood kids and mags and. Right, right, right. I always loved Sean Briley, and and I think. Didn't didn't Sean Briley have a friend who passed away and he he opened his ashes in the barrel and like let his ashes yeah yeah in. Yeah, yeah I remember that, was that so cool yeah yeah I do remember that that uh, was crazy yeah that always stuck in my head I think I was there that morning that was wild yeah so so you've made a name in Hawaii your top longboarder and you start doing a lot of film projects right I wouldn't say I made a name I got beat up over there for quite a few years in the beginning okay like that was just that was just my own comfort and in, in the beginning of being on the North Shore. I ran into trouble later when I got of the age when I just should have learned to keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But the years that I got in trouble over there, the 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 returning back and and taking the the shit that I deserved is what got me to be comfortable. Do you uh -huh. know what I mean? And you had yet to start doing jujitsu at this oh, time. Oh yeah, I had no idea any of that kind of stuff. But it's good. I learned early to like you know if you if what's that saying if you're uh, if you're gonna be dumb you better be tough. Yeah. 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 And and so you did a lot of film projects, right? You did um, yep. Joe Scott. You did Thomas Campbell of uh, several films. Yeah, we did. I did one with Joe, two with Joe, but they were really spread apart, like ten years apart. And then two with Thomas, well, one with Thomas. I only did the the first one. The rest were all his. I mean, I participated in them, but the the first one was kind of like, yeah. Was that fun? Was it fun working on those projects? Yeah, Joe's was cool because it wasn't really a project. It was just different times throughout a course of a couple of years that we had filmed and then put it together and and, and made a movie and mm -hmm. then longer was the same thing it was like the 10 years after we had made the first one and it was like 10 years of footage and mm -hmm. and and we put that one out um which is wild because you can't do that now you can't take like 10 years mm -hmm. to like make a movie yep yep <laughs> but you could then and, um and then with thomas campbell it was the seedling i think thomas was the seedling and and that was one that the my friend Mitch paid a huge portion of it to get made, and we kind of, you know, helped Thomas. Thomas had a vision. I mean, he wanted to make a movie when I first met him that, that was what kind of gave me the interest in, like, wanting to work with him. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? He mm -hmm. had kind of, like, refreshing new ideas and, like, an, uh, an outlook on surfing that was sort of being overlooked. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there was so much... More experimental boards. Yeah, playing there was around. so much push towards one thing that it sort of like overlooked all the other cool shit that was going on. And Thomas, from a skate perspective, way was way more attracted to the to the dance than the mm -hmm. than the you know the thrash sort yeah, of part. So. For, for sure. I mean, I think about it now. I watched it. I haven't seen the movie in a long time, but I watched it not that long ago with a friend, and it was like it's pretty unique. It helped our whole movement for a lot of people to like make a living off of this little niche mm -hmm. area you know so it's good yeah it wasn't easy to make a living right i mean i have many friends from that generation who were longboarders who went who were in the events went to the festivals went to the world event world uh contest etc and i'm always struck by how little money there was and it was really just about fun and experience which is kind of cool in many ways i mean i think that it's kind of the same now yeah yeah. There's really not a lot of money in it. I mean, but the it's funny because you have the money sort of in the world tour with the high performance guys and it many in many ways it sort of puts the blinders on and they're solely focused on winning the event whereas the longboard dudes that I know would like get on a plane and fly to Noosa and get drunk that night and miss their heat in the morning because they were hung up. Yeah, hung that over. happens a lot. We yeah. get that in my events. We get kids that just come and they have way too much fun. Margo. Yeah. Knock it off. They have way too much fun. And they don't get to do that very often. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or they just sort of like forget about the contest. And and I'd have to like tell them the next day. I'm like, man, would you like, can you wait till it like tonight? Yeah. Can you let those get through the first day? You know what I mean? Yeah, but for it's sure. just for, uh, for us, the fun part is more important than the, the winning. Yeah, you know? I think it's great. I mean, it's very much in the spirit of surfing as I knew it growing up. And everyone sticks around to watch. That's the cool part. Mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. us, whoever leaves early is the one that everybody makes fun of. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You see who packed up and left? You know what I mean? It's like that's the stuff that everybody like right, talks right. shit on. Yep. You know, they're like, look who packed up and bailed, couldn't take it's like Yeah. Leaving. You gotta the stick tribe. around, especially if you've like gone all this distance to be there. You might as well stay and celebrate who wins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Donald used to always tell me everybody's a great winner, not many are good losers, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, two thousand four you won a world another world title in Beeritz. What'd that mean? Uh so the first one I had to win on a tri-fin, 
you know, because back then you couldn't really write single fins in contests. Mm -hmm. You get underscored. You know what I mean? It's kind of like riding a fish in a in a CT now. I see. They just immediately, it's like minus like three, yeah. you know? Yeah, Back then, that's kind of what it was for the longboard thing. So I had to kind of meet in the middle, mm -hmm. right? All my equipment was sort of like conformed to the format, you know? It is what it is. If you want to win, you got to be able to figure out a way to do it. And, yeah. And those boards were super heavy. I still have all of them. They're mm -hmm. like super, super heavy, even in comparison to what people ride now. They're like boats, but they they had two little nubs and, mm -hmm. you know, made the board free up enough to where it didn't look as slow as a single fin. And, and mm -hmm. you know, you have to, you have to kind of nose ride in like higher parts of the wave so it looks a little more critical. Mm -hmm. There's no like flat, just stuff that a judge who doesn't do it and wouldn't understand that kind of eliminates it you know yeah. what i mean and that's yeah. usually a lot of the problem a lot of the judges don't know what's going on because yeah. they don't really surf like that yeah so for them the the idea of the board moving more mm -hmm. is more appealing mm -hmm. does that make sense it absolutely it's, does it's, it's not their fault it's just it's what they're used to judging on yeah know? no and that's something i want to talk to you about because there's a you you surf very very smoothly um what are you going for when you surf what is it about footwork cross-stepping type stuff is i mean you do kind of all of it i guess that's the thing that i've i've watched you surf a lot and um i often see a combination i see things that as a short border really inspire me in terms of point parts of the weight wave you hit and then there's cross-stepping stuff that's not in my world at all and there's nose riding stuff that's not in my world at all so you there's there's a sort of hybrid that you have yeah it's a mix but it's from it's from riding all the different boards uh -huh. like i i I can definitely say there was a benefit from that era of when I rode the two plus ones. Yep. I just know where to fit the board in different parts of the wave because mm -hmm. those boards allow you to do that. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. then, then riding really old equipment since I was little, I also understand like weight distribution and like, like where heavy boards will go through things where light boards won't and like inertia and like all these things that unless you really study and ride all the different boards, you ain't ever going to figure it out. Mm hmm it's, yeah. It's just it is what it is. You can't make up that time put in. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And having access to all these people's collections since I was little, I got lucky, dude. People would reach out to me and offer shit to ride. And yeah. I was the only kid that had any interest in riding it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's just, you, you know, you drive that many different cars, you're going to have a, a, your understanding of like, take off and go is a little different than, than most. Yeah, for know? sure. And then you've got sort of older, more classic dudes probably influencing you. And then you've got like street skate. You were skateboarded a lot you too, skated right? the entire time. Yeah, so you've, so these, that's a very sort of disparate um, influences or inspirations, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in, in UC, you know what I mean? So I couldn't always get to the beach and I had a lot of friends that skated. Mm -hmm. Skating was awesome. Peter Hewitt grew up in our neighborhood. I don't know if you know who that is, but it's like a, a mm -hmm. famous skater. Yep. And then, you know, when I was like 15, I met Danny Way and, and Chris Markovich. And those were my buddies, like in my like 16, 17, 18. I was around those guys a lot. That was super influential. You know, Nathan Fletcher, same deal, same stuff. You yeah. Know, Nathan and I were always skating and doing stuff. I was connected to all this like core shit, but I thought that the, the longboard stuff to me just like, I don't know, it was cool. Did you ever want to do airs in the surf? I did on my longboard. Yeah. I thought Christian Fletcher was the coolest thing ever in 1988, yeah. 1989, 1990, 1991. Yep. You know what I mean? 1992. Yep. And Israel Paskowitz at that time uh, was riding these super light Timmy Patterson longboards and he was like doing airs. And mm -hmm. like, I did it. I tried them and I could do them on shortboards, but mm -hmm. I just, I don't know, when that fad went away at that time, I, it, I stopped doing them too. You yeah. know what I mean? And then yep. tube riding really became like a, like, like, I think, yeah, once I turned like 16, 17, Pipeline was kind of everything to mm -hmm. me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You're listening to Soundings with Jamie Brissick. This podcast and the Surfer's Journal are made possible due to TSJ's subscribing members and through the sponsorship of Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. To learn more about the Surfer's Journal and its sponsors, or to subscribe, please visit surfersjournal.com. Now, back to our guest, Joel Tudor. Okay, so we're at your house in Del Mar, and I remember being here, I want to say the late 90s, early aughts maybe, and Wayne Lynch was staying here, and Michael Halsband, the photographer, was staying here, and you guys were working on a book project together. Yep. A lot of it shot in Hawaii, as I remember. A lot of shot in Hawaii, a lot of it shot here. We shot kind of everywhere that I had an opportunity to, that I knew there were going to be people that I could drag to get photos of before it was like, 
you know, because everyone was getting older and they're getting cranky or they've been burned by this guy or, you know what I mean? I knew the opportunity to get pictures of them before they were un, not wanting to do it was, was kind of crucial. Yeah. And Michael, you know, he was really good at it. When I'd seen the stuff he had done, I was like, God, I could take a lot of people to do this, but it's like, if I have to take somebody that they're going to be impressed by. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, not by their work, but just like the way the guy acts and like how he uses the camera. And, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he had so much experience of shooting wild portraits of different people that it's like he never really made them feel like he was stealing anything from them when he took the pictures do you yeah, know what i mean sure. and then most of them once they would watch him work and they would see like the cameras he was using a different shit they'd be like what is that what what, what do you do? you know what i mean yeah he was and, clearly a new york photographer as opposed yeah, to a surf photographer he did not have an ounce of surf anything and i think that was the unique part of when yeah. he would shoot guys they would just like i mean he, he shot greeno the one day and that night I was asleep and I heard our, our door of the hotel and it was George. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? George came to talk about cameras. Hmm. He like showed up to just like literally grill him on cameras because he hadn't met anyone that knew that much about cameras. Do you know what I mean? And, wow. and they both just like went nerding on like all this shit. And hmm. it was cool. Wow. But, you know. And you met through that book and you probably knew a lot of them already, but I know some of the portraits in the book, there were so many interesting people in there, right? Yeah, I just Bob wanted to McCavish. shoot all the, I wanted to get all the people that were influential, like they were cool to me as a young age and influential and and did cool stuff to help me along the way. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I didn't want to make a book about myself and it was kind of about me, Yeah. but it was more about like, I was just telling stories about them. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, the cool thing is your influence is, is about you still, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you can, you can sort of track that thing. Among those people, anyone really stand out? Anyone hugely influential that, that steered you in directions that you remember and were important? I mean, I got to kind of get everybody in there. Do you know what I mean? At, at least that I, I mean, there were a few that I would like to have gotten into that, I, that, 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 you know, didn't like, I tried to get Phil Edwards. He didn't really want to participate. Mm -hmm. Some people just don't like cameras, yep. you know? What about Mickey Dora? Uh, Dora was awesome. Um, but he said no in the beginning. You know, I kind of like, I started to ask him this one day. He was like, eh, nah, you know, I'm like, oh, dude, come on. Mm -hmm. you dick. Like, you can't like. When am I ever going to get this opportunity again? Yeah. You know, and then I had to have Donald intervene and Donald kind of called him on it. Like, really? You're really going to pull this shit and not let him like get pictures of you, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once Donald intervened, then he said he would do it. But mm -hmm. him and Michael had to write an, uh, a contract on, I think it was on like a table napkin. Okay. Or some shit. Door, door shit. Yeah, yeah. Funny. Of like, you know, like you can have these, there were all these like rules to what he could do with the images and different stuff. So, uh -huh. and he counted frames when they took the stuff, he would like count the roll for him. Wow. That's a roll. Huh? That's a roll. Mickey. Well, you know, he's professional, <laughs> man. What about, uh, how was George Greeno? Um, Greeno was cool, but I, I've been going around there since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was just like another time I showed up, you yep. know what I mean? And, but this time I brought a guy that was, you know, interesting with camera information. Mm. Well, the other times you just kind of go and, 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 you know, he's pretty lonely up there on that little hill in the yeah. middle of nowhere. So it's like any kind of people that go, come out of their way to come see him, he lights up. And, yep. and, uh, but yeah, the first time I went, I went with Nat's kid with Bo. We, okay. we both went over there just to kind of, because I don't think Bo had seen him since he was a little kid. And I wanted to meet him. I could hear all these stories. And, mm -hmm. So they sent us there. But this is pre-cell phone. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like We actually had to like drive up like 20 different driveways through Broken Head trying to find him. Okay. And then finally, someone pointed us in the pyramid. They're like, it's that one right there, mate. Fucking over uh -huh, the hill, uh -huh. you know. Uh, he was sitting there on the phone in a pair of cut-up jean shorts. I mean, it was kind of like, just like what you expected, you know. Yeah. That was the time when he was doing a lot of filming of dolphins underwater. Yeah, he was yeah. still filming a ton. Yeah, I that remember cool. that. Yeah. He was still filming a ton. And, and I mean, he was, shit, that was 20-something years ago. What is mm. he now? He's 80, so he would have been in his late 50s, early 60s. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you become quite well known and your what you're known for because it's less about chasing the world tour and going to contests all the time your uh i'll use the word odyssey again takes you to all these interesting places i mean i remember hanging out with you in new york city in in the 2000 2001 kind of thing you were accessing places that a lot of surfers don't get to go to i guess uh but again it was it was all of my friends as a kid were 30 years older than me dude yeah yeah <laughs> yeah like when I was 16, the guys I was meeting through Donald were all like Studio 54 dudes. Mm -hmm, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, hung out with like Peter Beard and Cheryl Teague. And, and yeah. they were the ones that were inviting me to New York. Mm -hmm. And when I finally got there, like that, that 
I just had access to cool shit. And I, it was the only place when you're underage that you could do, and at that time you could do whatever you wanted in mm-hmm. New York City as a, as a pre-21 year old. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was kind of crazy. It felt like Europe because I had spent all my summers as a kid uh, in Europe where it's just, you, you have complete freedom. Mm-hmm. Everyone's on a moped and stays up till three. And you yeah, know what I mean? Sure. It was where like in America, there were so many rules. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, and I got to New York and I'm like, whoa, I found like Europe East. You yeah. know what I mean? That's what it was. And there was like all these cool people and it was so mixed. You know what I mean? It was so foreign from, from what I'd grown up out here, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. the influence of all, like at that time, it was like a magnet for cool people from all over the world that, that were doing creative uh, stuff, yeah. you know? Did that influence you, your surfing and kind of your entire outlook being around? I mean, you met some really interesting people that are not necessarily just surfers or not, not even surfers at all. I realized that the longboard community had like educated me in a different way than like the jock side of pro surfing. For sure. Where I like had a, a, I don't know, it had, it had given me an, a, a slight edge in, in culture to where I was able to like fit in back there a little easier Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that comfort and fun was was uh, addicting as a kid you know what i mean and and the surf scene there was really like non-existent Mm -hmm. i mean it wasn't for people that live there Mm it's not like i found some shit that no one knew about if Mm -hmm. you live back there it was always a thing yeah but they never bragged about it Mm -hmm. and and there was kind of a disrespect from from the surf world in general like surf magazines had told a lie forever yeah that the wave sucked Mm -hmm. but i found this weird left point that no one was surfing do you know what i mean i was like holy shit mm. <laughs> there's mm-hmm. left out here and it was really good you know what i mean and it was only like a, a hop skip and a jump from from being in the city at night and uh you know and then the culture of that town too was so fucking unique mm-hmm. like montauk like, yeah was so bitching God, yeah. like from 1994 to i forget what year that guy made that book the end or whatever yeah, that, that kind of like brought a lot of attention to yeah. the Hamptons and really changed the, the, the beach scene out there sure. a ton yeah. because it exposed people just kind of thought it was like a sleepy fit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything stopped town. after the Hamptons. They didn't yeah. go any further. They're like, Oh, I'm not going out there. Yeah. yeah. Real salt of the earth people out there. And it was cheap yeah. to live out there back then. I oh, think. and I dug that too, man. I grew up, you know, you, if you grew up a long border in the eighties, you had to have thick skin. Mm-hmm. Like heckling was just part of it. Yeah. Waxed windows. You yep. know what I mean? People yep. just constantly busting your balls. And, yeah. and then when I landed there, it was just like, whoa, it's still like such a thing. Uh-huh. I thought it was so uh-huh. cool. I loved it. You know? Yeah. All that sharp wit, people make it funny. You didn't realize it. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> just like yeah. good stuff. You yeah. Know? And um, how and when did you get into jujitsu? Uh, I think it was 2002, something like that. I mean, I knew about it. I watched the first UFC in Hawaii at mm-hmm. the lifeguards. Mm-hmm. I remember watching it with all the lifeguards with Joe Glonk on them because at that time lifeguards were all training. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah, they were all like they were all super into it. And I'd seen some fights like on the beach and shit over mm-hmm. my lifetime where I saw people getting choked and mm-hmm. you know different stuff. So I kind of knew about it. And then I just uh, my ex-wife, um, she had trained. She's from Maui, you know, and she'd like we'd ran into my friend outside of Mitch's, my friend Mike Powers, and. He was like, oh, you got to come in, you know, and she was kind of like the one that really pushed it. It was like, okay, let's go. I'll go with you. So we both went to the first class together. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I just got addicted. It was cool. And I had a lot of time. Like, that's the one thing. Pro servers, we can't really make the excuse that we don't have time. Yeah, there's a lot of time. We just have a shitload of time to do stuff in between when it's windy. And and, and I was just about to have my first kid. Uh You know what I mean? Uh Uh-huh. So it was just like, it was just a perfect, like, when you say it was addictive, what was it exactly? Was was it like afterglow of, of after training? Was it? Um, did you like all the technique and the how intelligent it is? No, I just liked that being like little and skinny. You actually had you had a chance. Uh huh. Do you know what I mean? Did you get picked on or beaten up when you were younger? I mean, dude, being a longboarder, of course you got picked on. That yeah, it's like inevitable. But I mean, it's like it's like how do you process it? Some people take it and it bothers them for the rest of their life. Or you use it as a building block to just like get ahead. Yeah. Like I took it as motivation. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you can fucking pick on me, I'll fucking show you. You yeah. know what I mean? And that that kind of like. How long did it take you to get to where you could show them? It wasn't very long. Yeah, I get that. It was I really mean, quick, dude. I started to get it really fast. I well, mean, it was like, I, and then and then once I started to get good, obviously, I came from one of the most competitive gyms in California at the time, and they were immediately like, "You need to compete. Mm-hmm. You need to compete." Mm-hmm. And then I started competing, and. I did good in the first one I did, you mm-hmm. know, and then that became addicting because I'd, I'd had so much experience of like competing in front of a huge stage mm-hmm. that these little tournaments of people screaming in the stands didn't seem like anything. Yeah. You know? Yep. It was almost kind of a joke. Uh-huh. I had like an edge. 
Because I used to always be like, I'd like look at the other day and be like, this fucker will drown if I take him out and like three foot surf. He mm -hmm. won't even like make it, you know? Yeah. Not that it ever helped me having that mentality. I got absolutely smoked times thinking that, but mm -hmm. like it did calm the nerves a little bit when you actually had to step out and do stuff. When you had sort of a natural skill, was it, um, do you think it was from surfing and skating all your life and being in the water? Yeah, because now that I've been doing it for so long and I see people come from different skill, skill sets, I can tell right away when they tell me what they've done. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, okay, this guy's going to be tough. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's certain sports that people do that just have like dexterity involved. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And mm -hmm. they'll be able to move quicker than most, you mm -hmm. know? And then there's some people that just have God-given talent that you would never even like think it comes from. Yeah. You know? Yep. It's pretty cool. Any wild fights in uh, in jujitsu that you uh, remember? Um, well, I competed at a really high level. I think people kind of forget how long I competed for. You know what I mean? Because the surf world doesn't really like talk about it. Obviously, like, every now and then they'd bring up little like blurps about different stuff. But I competed for like ten years. Mm -hmm. You know, at mm -hmm. the very highest level, and uh, I did it in the masters division. And then when I got my black belt, I was in the masters division. I competed in the adult division, and I had a ton of success mm -hmm. doing that. Um, you know, and you just get to a point where it's like once Judah was born, the second kid, I, I couldn't, I just didn't have time to devote to like training like that all the time. I still train every day, uh -huh. like, you know, but I just couldn't like be lifting weights and trying to cut weight, doing all this stuff and be a dad of two kids. And it's like, it just, yep. and still have a surf career and all the other stuff that wasn't, wasn't going to happen. Yeah. So competing kind of came to a halt, I'd say in like 2012, maybe. Uh, uh huh. What were your highest achievements? You won a world title. I won right? two world titles, yeah. uh, but they were master's division. Do you know what I mean? Like I didn't ever win anything as an adult. That's like a whole nother, that is a whole nother jump. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's like literally like, like as a, as a master, you'll fight like, you know, four fights as an adult, you'll fight like eight. Yeah. Like in the same day. Yeah. So there's a totally different, uh, different achievement. I made it to the, I, I got invited to ADCC, which is huge. Um, what people have to go through to make the invite is like impossible mm -hmm. or to like win the trials is like shooting yourself. It's mm -hmm. just like so much work, but I actually did get a legit invite in 2009 because I had, I had had a ton of success competing as a brown belt. And in the beginning of my black belt, I ended up submitting the dude that won that tournament two years prior in the uh, finals match of the U uh, S open in, here in long beach. And it was like, I mean, it was wild because he was the best in the world at that time. Do you know what I mean? And I was like this 30-year-old. He was 24. Mm -hmm. I think I was 32. Okay. And uh, I caught him like like right off the bat. Like I didn't beat, beat him on points. I actually fucking made him tap, mm -hmm. which is like wild. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, that a pro server. Do you know what I mean? Like it's never, it'll never happen again. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, especially like when it's like two different variances. He was the very best in the world for grappling. I was the best longboarder in the world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't think like Hicks and son before the fight came up to me cause he was on their team mm -hmm. and he's all, you're about to get fucking smoked. Hmm. Cause Crone and I grew up competing. You know okay. what I mean? We both competed like all the like purple brown, all that kind of stuff. We were at tournaments all the time. So he came up right before the match started to tell me I was about to lose. Yeah. And then I caught him. Yeah. What a trip to have gone from, you know, surf contests, winning them, being in the finals, and then jump into jujitsu and be doing basically the same thing and traveling across the world for events. Yeah. Uh, but the best one though, was it Andre Galvao, who's like, like the Kelly of, you know what I mean? He's mm -hmm. like multiple time jujitsu world champ. He had met me as a white belt, you know what I mean? And watched my whole projection to black. Yeah. And he made a joke. He told her and he goes, the fuck dude, did someone give this guy a parachute? He just fell on our industry. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, <laughs> he mm -hmm. was like, he literally just like jumped out of a plane hmm. and landed here. He was like making jokes. He was coming yeah. to parachute us too. Right, right. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, because he said, he goes, it's bizarre, dude, to watch. Do yeah. you know what I mean? He yeah. was like, I literally six years ago, I saw you as a white belt. Uh -huh. And he's like, and now you're here competing. How long does it typically get to get to get a brown? It takes a, a decade. Okay. So you did it almost half the time. I did it almost six years. Yeah. yeah. Because I competed at every belt and uh -huh. I won at every single belt. Wow. So... That was why my my projection was so fast. You know? what, what's so cool about that, too, is it's a time when um, some surfers are slowing down, at least in maybe in the shortboard department, yep. um, and fitness sometimes starts to go on the wane, I think. Yep. And I imagine it would have been cool to be in your 30s going, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting it as hard as I ever have physically. Yep. Yeah, and then I blew my knee out, you know. That was kind of a big deal, too. That kind of put a, a – and it wasn't even from jiu-jitsu. I did it skateboarding. Okay. 
You know what I mean? And that, be honest with you, kind of is what was the final draw for like competing in jujitsu because it's like my knees healed. Mm-hmm. I had surgery and all that shit. I had my ACL replaced, but I'm never gonna go through that again. Yeah. And jujitsu competing, I could do that so easily, and I don't want to ever like take that much time out of the water ever again in my life. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Do you, you have an academy here in Delmar? Yeah, right down the street. There's you, a class running right now as we speak. Are you there a lot? Yeah, I'm there every day that I'm home. Uh huh. Someone's got to clean the toilet. Yeah. You know what I mean? Pride yeah. of ownership. Nice. Last year, you won a world title at age 45. What was that like? Uh, cool. I quit competing at 28, right? I stopped. And then I've been doing my contest for 10 years. We're on our 22nd one coming up. Mm-hmm. Duct tape invitation, Duct tapes, yeah. which I want to get into with which you as well. Which is coming up soon. It's okay. like a month or two away. Um, dude, I knew I could always like... Do you know what I mean? But I didn't want to be the fucking Uncle Rico of like, give me one more round. I got that. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. I wanted to bow out gracefully and and yeah. and not like just make an ass out of yourself trying to like, you know what I mean? Um, but I kind of always knew I still had a, if I really wanted to, I could have at any moment made a, a return, but I had a million things going on. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? It was like, we I had a wetsuit company and I had my surfboard stuff going on and all this other shit that was, was kind of preoccupied. Yeah. Um, but it didn't make sense. And having a kid and competing in jiu-jitsu, it just didn't. And really, the, the way that they were judging longboarding at that time, it was it was like, based off of the way they'd been judging me and, and like the event prior, I was convinced there was no way they're going to let me win. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They've been pretty tough on giving me scores. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of it's just like, I don't move a lot. Do you know what I mean? My body's real stiff. Mm-hmm. It's like, I think I'm maybe a little too overly smooth and it goes against me because right. it looks like I'm not doing enough Yep. where they don't really understand the nuances of like less movement. You know what I mean? Sure. So it kind of works against me. And after the pool event, I was like, fuck, they're not going to let me win. Uh, the Noosa event, the only reason I went was because Devin got the job. Do you know what I mean? His tour director. Yep. I've never really had anyone in, in <laughs> my favor over there. Mm-hmm. If anything, it's been the other way because I've always been so vocal of like what they're doing wrong. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I always took it personal if they never listened to any of the advice that I gave them. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'd be like offering advice and they'd just like talk down to me. And I'm like, man, I'm the most qualified one around here to give you any advice on longboarding. Do you know what uh-huh. I mean? Maybe you would want to listen to this shit. And you were trying to and kind of give them ideas that guidance better Guidance and just yeah. like listening. Do you know what I mean? Like what they should focus on and what things are important and what like, what's going to be a bigger crowd draw and you know what I mean? All the things that like it, give their investors a reason to give them money to run the contest. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Why do you think they were closed off to your ideas? Because I was always on a different, there's always been this push for like this progressive like movement thing. And I was just like, like little irritating chihuahua biting at their feet. That was just like, Hey man, the dance is more important. Yeah. The progression is the other side. Do you know what I mean? That's like shortboarding. Do you know what I mean? We've got something so cool about us that they can't sell. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. we can do this in anything. We don't need like special conditions and all this other shit. And we've also got women, you know, the women's longboard thing is just like, it's such a cool. Yeah. Oh my God, it's it's so cool to watch. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's so elegant and it's so appealing for, Absolutely. for people that don't surf. They watch it and they're like, wow, that was so like cool to watch. Yeah, you really you know get the I mean? ballet connection when uh, you see uh, and it. And yeah. just it's just math. We don't we don't yeah. have that. Yeah. You know? Um, you know, after 10 years of the duct tape success and so many people pushing for that particular style of, of surf stuff. You know, Devin was able to like get them to massage the verbiage of the rules a little bit, and like one term changed where it, it made like style more important. You know, and and so that kind of seemed appealing for me to maybe show up at one. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and I wanted to take Tosh because he's gonna want to do this stuff at some point. You yep. know? Yep. So it was like really my first family surf trip with just my two boys was mm-hmm. to go to Australia, mm-hmm. and I was gonna go no matter what. Tosh was gonna do the the new sub junior boys and stuff. And, um, and then Devin knew I was going and he said, Hey man, I got a spot. Mm-hmm. You know, do you want to do it? Uh, if you want to do the, the, I had to start in round one. He didn't mm-hmm. do me any favors. Mm-hmm. I started at the very beginning of the event and I ended up winning, mm-hmm. but then the tour stopped. Do you know what I mean? Like okay. we got a halt. We had to halt because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just because of the last two years, it got, yep. it got halted. Um, and then when they, they started again, I mean, I didn't have anything going. My events were still on hold. It wasn't like I was going to say no. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did the pool one, and I think I got sixth. Okay. 
Which is this, dude, that pool is so hard to ride on a longboard. That thing is like, I gave the people that did well in that pool, I gave them all the credit in the world. That shit is so difficult to ride on a big hmm. board. It's mm-hmm. the last kind of wave I would ever ride a longboard in. I would uh-huh. switch and ride something else. You yeah, know? right. And I had gone the year before with Quintal, who just obliterated everybody on the most wide, unuser friendly board you could ride. And it kind of threw me for a loop. I was like, oh man, maybe I need to like get like a different piece of equipment or maybe I should take like a huge board. And I did. I took this giant, like almost 10 foot board and the thing was just like trying to control a dinosaur in that pool. Hmm. But I still finished pretty good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually should have been in the lead the whole time, but the WSL had, had this thing where they were giving double points for the last two events. So even with a first and a sixth, I was behind a dude that had a first and a 23rd Mm -hmm. and another dude that had a second and a 13th were ahead of me. And I had a first and a sixth. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I actually, I I hope they understand that motivated me to win the last one because I was pissed off. Yeah. I was like, really? You fuckers have me in third behind two guys that I'm clearly in the lead head of. Uh Fuck you. You know what I mean? And then they put out a thing. This really pissed me off. They did this thing of like all of the scenarios of who could win. Yep. And they had everybody else like winning mm-hmm. except for me. They didn't see the They didn't numbers. have a, a scenario of me winning. Huh. They had it all these other guys and then had it, they had to lose for me to win. And I was like, oh, you motherfuckers, just, just, kid, you, you fucked yourselves. Yeah. Like, I honestly, I, I, that, I said that the second I saw it, I go, you all screwed yourselves. And that fired you up. Well, I think they overlooked something. So, in the history of Malibu and longboard events, I'm the most winning goofy foot ever okay i'm the only goofy foot to ever win a pro event there on, ever on your backhand ever yeah dude no pro no goofy foots have ever won pro events there i think huh. except for ralph arness okay it was the last time someone won one there uh-huh and i've done it like a handful of times do you know what i mean mm-hmm. and i i've been surfing there since 1987 do you know what i mean like every single summer mm-hmm. the majority of my childhood you know all the way through both it's not like I'm not there all the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know I the wave that. through every fucking mood, yeah. all the tides, all yeah. the, I know, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, I, and that really pissed me off. I was just like, one, you have me in third, which was like insulting because I was clearly off of point standings. I was in the lead. Mm-hmm. And then that you didn't have me in any scenario of winning against guys that I could clearly beat. Like that was just a really stupid. Why do you think, did they have a beef with you? or do you No, because I'm, well, I'm one. It, they have a beef older. with me because they talk shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm older, so they weren't going to put me in this like scenario. Right. And my dad was there, which was pretty funny because he's normally not at any of my events, and he doesn't definitely, after the Malibu event in 94, he was not in a hurry to want to go back. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but he's been my biggest and best surf critic of because he judged me all through my childhood. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And he's just blatantly honest. So... You know, if I'm like losing or if someone's better than me, he'll tell me. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. hey, you got to watch out for that one. That one's fucking, the k- 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 could give you problems, yep. you know? Yep. And he did it twice that day. You know what I mean? He was like, he's like, Harrison could give you a really hard time. You know what I mean? He's like, but you guys are obviously on the other right, other side of the deal. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Connie, that kid's really good. You know, he's like, I like watching him surf. And he's like, so you got to, you got to watch out. Mm-hmm. And, and I had Connie in my one heat. You know, but when I beat him, I kind of knew right then. I was like, oh, I'm going to win. Mm-hmm. Like, if I got through him, I'll get through the rest of them, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then Harrison lost. He did the classic. So I'm competing. I don't know if people know this, but you always have one bad heat. It's not that you lose in that heat, but you don't win your heat. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. There's always one. Even if you win every round, there's always one that's shaky. Mm-hmm. Or you'll be behind half the heat. You right. know what I mean? Or yeah. whatever. You have one where that's just it's the performance isn't perfect. Yep. But all the rest of them normally kind of go, especially when you're on like a path to winning. Mm-hmm. They all kind of go at the same like rate. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's like a ramp. You're like ramping up, ramping up. You almost always want to have the shitty heat in the beginning, like yeah. between first and second round. You uh-huh. want to get it out of the way. It's like first round jitters or second round jitters. He didn't have that. In the pool event, he served flawless all the way. And then the round that counted, he fucking, he ate mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. And then he did it at Malibu. He served flawless the entire way. Didn't have a bad heat. And then had his bad heat the round that it counted. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and where I don't think I really surfed at my absolute best. I just knew the wave better than everybody. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I knew exactly which ones were making it around the hump. I knew which ones to take at high tide. Mm-hmm. Where a lot of guys didn't, you know. And that's just me being an old fuck and yeah, right. being around forever and yeah. served it forever. Yeah. And I was pissed off. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Which will motivate anybody when you're basically being like, like. Did you take the pissed off stuff right to the final? Like you I f- took it, dude, all the way until I won. Um, what else pisses you off in surfing? 
That was it. Uh-huh. Everything else, I, people, people. See, here's one thing: no one knows, understands my sense of humor, which is really horrible. I mean, the people that are my close friends do. I am a huge smartass. Uh-huh. I've been that way since I was a little kid. If you've known me, it's never changed. I grew up around the biggest smartasses in surfing, the '60s generation. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. The most like heckling, make you pay your dues respect earned all that that i come from that group yeah do you know what i mean yeah uh i didn't have an nssa upbringing yeah i was around that young and and you know what i mean yeah so while you were wearing team outfits do you know what i mean i had a totally different you yeah. know yeah and and i can't help it i'm just gonna it's the way I am. And a lot of people in this ever sensitive era of just like getting offended by any little thing of everything, they get really upset at my blatant honesty. Yeah. You know what I mean? And on social media, you've got yeah, a, a lot of Yeah, I'm just really honest, dude. I'm not yeah. like, I don't have a beef with anybody. I'm just a, a smart ass. Uh-huh. Everybody told me how it was when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just am in this, I'm also in this position where like, you know, I'm in my 40s. Like I was at a pipe the other day. Everyone's gone, dude. Mm-hmm. Everyone quit mm-hmm. or they're out of shape. Or they're scared to be out there. Yeah. Or their time's come and gone. You know what I mean? Like most everybody quits. Yeah. It's wild. Yep. And I think I, I growing up around skipping these guys, I don't understand how that's even possible. He's 80. Yeah. And still shredding every day and dicking with fins. And every time I go down there, he's showing me some weird thing he's working on. And it's just like surfing's way too cool to quit. Yeah. And there's so many like opportunities and and categories of it to be able to do it till the very end. Yeah that I just, I'm still so fascinated with all of it. You know what I mean? What fires you up the most at this point? I'm building surfboards. I just opened a factory. Uh huh. I talked shit for 20 years that I was going to do it. And I finally did it. You know? Tell me about the factory. The, this, this pandemic <laughs> gave me the time to do it. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Uh huh. It also, it put me in a situation because of this fucking, this, this thing the last two years, all the surfboard factories. I don't know if anyone remembers this, but I predicted this about five years ago and I got jumped on by everybody. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're fucking so grumpy. Boo, boo, boo. And I was like, no. I said, when Diamond closed, I go, you guys don't understand what's happening. With these big factories closing, all these little ones are going to get double booked. And then it, there's going to come a time when the surfboard industry is going to pick up again mm-hmm. and no one's going to be able to get anything done. Yeah. And it exactly what happened. So you got a you got a factory that's in demand right now. Well, no, we're not in demand. We have we have enough of our own work between myself and Birch, like because my you know people tend to forget all the stuff that I have my hands in and different shit. My partner is Ryan Birch's distribut- distributor, mm-hmm. Derek Disney. Uh, he has all these different things. We have Moon Wetsuits. He has a shop up here in in Cardiff called Resincraft. Um, we both partnered up because with all the different brands that he builds surfboards for and distributes. There's not a glassing house available to do all of it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we were in this huge line behind everybody at these other places where it's like, dude, how are you supposed to have a business? Do you yeah. know what I mean? If you can't get anything done. Yep. And, you know, luckily my family's from construction, so I was able to get my dad to, to you know, build the thing for us. Because mm-hmm. good luck trying to get a construction guy right now. Everything's yep. like, you know, super, super booked. Yep. Uh, you know, we looked everywhere for, for like six months and then finally found a place. Mm-hmm. You know, right down here in San Diego, and it's it's perfect. I mean, once we opened the door, we were full with work. You know what I mean? But it was just uh, trying to find the place and going through the process. And yep, being in there with the boards, does it um, get you fired up on design? Get you thinking about design? Yeah, I'm always thinking about stuff yeah. constantly. I'm yeah. always. I mean, I'm still surfing real waves. You know. Yep. I'm still surfing pipelines. So I'm still like my brain's. You con- know, I have a kid now that's surfing it. Yeah. Tell me. Let's talk about being a dad. Um, my son's out there now, and he's kind of you know, making his way in that little like group. You know, it takes time. Yep. But, but he gets it. He grew up surfing the same spots I do, surfs Big Rock, and so, and it's just like they're just they're, they're a learning curve for what the rest of the world's like. Because mm-hmm. I try to explain this to people. I when I hear guys are saying hey, localism is terrible, it's like, well, dude, you better not want to travel anywhere. Because if you think localism is bad here, wait till you go to the worlds where they're connected to the police mm-hmm. and their cousins are in the cartel. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah, I know those places. Okay, you think that the localism's bad here? You, whoa, dude, you mm-hmm. have no idea how the rest of the world works. Mm-hmm. And I get mad when people are like, you servers, you're so selfish, blah, blah, blah. It's the same shit in the corporate world, dude. The guy that's been there longer than you, you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't say shit. Yeah. If you do, you lose your job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just an office building. Seniority. Seniority. Yeah. It's in everything you do in life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And everything. Yeah. And if you don't want to deal with it, you're going to get kicked to the back of the line every fucking time. Unless you're either uber talented 
super connected, or crazy as fuck. Mm -hmm. It's one of those three. Mm -hmm. Do you coach your kids a lot in surfing? Uh, I try to, but it's hard to coach them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You can't, I try to tell Tosh, and he just looks at me like I'm crazy. You uh -huh. know what I mean? Because he's got other friends, you know what I mean? And he's around all these other kids that are really good. So he listens to certain things, but I think about it like I didn't listen to my dad. So yeah. yeah. I don't take it personal because I like, right when I start to get bothered by it, I'm like, eh, well, I guess that was the same way. Yeah. What about the duct tape invitational? Tell me about uh, how that started and how long it's been going and all the stuff. Well, I always had a thing in my contract with Vans to be able to put events on that I never really like pursued it. They never really had the money to do it. And then they just finally got to a point where they had grown to where they, they could like take the time to, to create it. You know, we had had a, a bunch of pre-existing events that we sponsored, like the ECSC in Virginia. And the one guy, D, just kind of said, hey, I got room for a division. Do you guys want to throw a, a specialty division in? And so we did it. Um, we invited 16 of the best kids, and it it was, you know, it was a, a success. It was, huge. it was rad to watch intermixed with a, with a QS, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And even the people that were there were like, whoa, that was sick, because there had never been like a – a longboard contest where I picked, hand picked all the, you know what I mean? Yeah. And and then it turned into kind of a show. Yeah. And then that show just kept like growing, you know what I mean? Word of mouth, word of mouth. And then we got to a point where we realized we needed something because we in the very beginning we always would invite one girl mm -hmm. because the the gals can surf as good as the men, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Especially in the longboard thing, given the conditions and stuff. So uh, we would always invite one and they would always make it a couple rounds you know mm -hmm, what i mean like mm -hmm. make it to the first heat or whatever which it was rad when they would beat one of the dudes it was mm -hmm. like epic <laughs> it made mm -hmm. us like okay you get the point of why we're doing this you know mm -hmm. uh we were the first ever to pay women equally by nice. the way nice ever we Good. had the, at the u.s open when the wsl still paid the women less than the men mm -hmm. we paid the women equally to the men oh that's cool that's something I'll, yeah i it, know they were in the works of apparently like making it happen but they didn't make it happen at the event that we did so right. i kind of like you know what i mean yep. you could have stepped it up yeah and you, wrote a check out you know to the women for the same amount but they didn't you uh -huh. know what i mean so i'll take that one and pat you know the duct tape on the back forever for that mm -hmm. so how do your days go when you're home here in del mar what's a typical day like and do most most mornings you go straight to the surf every morning yeah i get up and i check the waves and i go to the surf and then i have class every day at 12 when mm -hmm. i'm home mm -hmm. and then every night at 6 30 so I'm there twice a day, and then I run to the factory in between. Are you diet conscious? Oh, yeah. I've been vegetarian for 20, 27 years. Uh-huh. Drink a lot of coffee? Every morning. Yeah. Religiously. <laughs> I'm a Laird. I'm a Laird. Uh, oh, yeah, me too. I'm a Laird subscriber. It's really good stuff. The turmeric and the uh, cacao is a really nice mix in the coffee. I got very lucky to be around Laird in the Oxbow days, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot about being motivated and not being lazy. mm by watching him. And what was that what, like? What was he doing that was inspiring? His diet, his workout regime, his consistency. Mm -hmm. His fucking up every day, fired up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Pretty cool shit. He yeah. was the one that ne he told me never stop moving. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. I, and I was around him a little bit, so it was cool. Yeah. And it was a, I was Tasha's age. Yep. I was 16 and 17 when I was around Laird. Uh-huh. What other golden nug nuggets did you learn uh, along the way through through the mentors that you... Through yeah. the mentors, I mean, uh, I, Shane Haram was kind of the one that got me to be vegetarian. Okay. Which is pretty Shane interesting. Was incredible. Shane was. I went to Japan with him when uh -huh. I was like 18, 18 or 19. I think it was 18 to 19 was the transition year. Yeah, I was like 18 or 19. I was writing for this company called Sunset Trading Company or whatever. And their distribution company was distributing his Rainbow Rock, uh, what, surf gear or whatever yep. it was he was making. Yep. Yeah, we went to Japan together and I just, he, dude, I watched the way he eat, he would eat. And him and Pagey were around each other then, mm -hmm. right? And Pagey used to be like, Gromit, you eat like a fucking trash can. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you've got to change your ways. Shit's going to catch up to you. Hmm. He used to, Pagey, between those two, they were the one that hammered in the, like, the eating healthy stuff. And then I just made a transition. Mm -hmm. And then I met Thomas, who was vegan, and we made that movie when mm -hmm. I was 19 or whatever, 20. So it just, like, it just started. And Thomas started introducing me to like Indian food and all this other shit that I, I mean, I grew up on like, you know, Coca-Cola and snowballs and yep. fucking yep. frosted flakes and donuts. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Fast food. And I mean, I ate like a trash can. Mm -hmm. I could understand why Pagey was concerned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, great to chat, Joel. Nice to chat with you, James. Yeah. Life's, life's good. Yeah. We're, no we're, complaints. We're still here. We're still here. Still getting tubed. Yeah.
Soundings is produced by me, Jamie Brissick, and Jonathan Shiflett. You can find it on Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. Our theme song is written and performed by Paz Lenchanton and Gita Valtistodor. It is produced by Paz Lenchanton and engineered by Samur Kuja. Soundings is brought to you by the Surface Journal, a reader-supported publication made possible by sponsorship from Birdwell, FCS, Patagonia, Rainbow, Vans, Visla, and Yeti. The Surface Journal is published bi-monthly. If you haven't done so yet, I encourage you to visit surfacejournal.com and subscribe. Thanks for listening to Soundings. We'll see you next time.